Well, we pray the Shema. Uh, how many times do you think that the people of Israel have prayed the Shema? Billions, gillions, gazillions, septillions, I don't even know how high it goes. Hear, O Israel, Shema. Uh, you think by now they would have shema <laughs> But the word doesn't mean to just hear the words. What, what does Shema mean? Do. do. Hear and do. This, the word says to not be just hearers of the word of God, but doers also thereof. Well, we're continuing uh, our journey uh, in the precepts of Messiah. Uh, we studied last uh, Shabbat, a portion of the Gospel of John. We're going to return to the Gospel of John. If you turn over to chapter 5, John chapter 5. And so we're looking at the stories of Messiah. We're looking at his words. So um, chapter 5, and we're going to begin in verse 40 in just a moment. Why do we look back at, at, these, at these stories of Messiah? I mean, haven't you read them before? I mean, why, why do we have to keep turning to them? Because God always reveals something new to us. Okay, so God always reveals something new to us. We don't, we don't, we don't want to forget. Um, do you forget stuff? Do you forget insignificant things? How about important things? So we always remember to refresh our minds and our spirits by looking back. Uh, in verse 40 of uh, John uh, chapter 5, of course, Messiah is, is bearing witness to the truth. He says, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. Ouch. That probably hit really hard. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. But how can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes only from God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father, for there is one who accuses you. Who? Moses, the prophet, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how you, will you believe my words? Okay, so that was probably um, the gut punch to the listeners there who had been seeing miracles. And what was the miracle that they just witnessed, just like in the previous that we looked at last week? The healing of the lame man at the pool. Okay, the healing of the man at the pool who had gone there for how many? Was it 36 years? 38 years? They just saw a miracle. They all knew him. They, they saw him for forever and a day. And so they just witnessed a miracle, but they didn't believe in him. Continuing in verse uh, 1 of chapter 6. After these things, Yeshua went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And there a great multitude followed him because, he saw, or because they saw signs which he performed on those who were diseased, which we just, of course, saw a second ago in the paralyzed man. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the, the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Okay, so he had just rebuked the, the, the people that were there very strongly. And so he withdrew, and, and where did he go? The other side of the sea. Okay, so other side of the sea, and then, then, then where did he go? Up, up into a mountain. Okay, so he had just told them a second ago that if you believed Moses, then you would believe my words. Because he taught, of course, in accordance with the prophets. Because the prophets, of course, spoke and taught in accordance with him. So, therefore, he was saying to them, you, you, you didn't believe the prophets. In fact, you don't believe them now. Oh, by the way, your fathers killed the prophets. And, and of course, again, that, that cut to the heart of the people that were listening. So... When he had said a second ago, I have come in my father's name, do you think they knew who he was talking about? 
do you think that when, when Messiah said, my father, do you think they knew who he, who he was referring to? Who, who was he referring to? God. Okay, so if he'd said, my father, who is God, oh, which would make him blasphemy. the son, which would, be, yeah. which would be potentially blasphemy, okay, and this was the common understanding of our people at the time of the two powers in heaven. They knew that God was invisible, but they also knew that God came in the form of a human being at various times and appeared. And so they understood there to be this, at least in, in the common understanding, that God was at least two, if not three, personages. Okay? Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Okay? God is one? Is, it, is that what it says? No, it doesn't. It says God is one composite unity. That is Echad. Okay, so our people have always known, only up till probably this, maybe the 4th, 5th, 6th century, that Judaism eliminated that understanding from, its, from what it taught. Why do you think that they did that? Why, why would they eliminate the understanding that God was a composite? Because it bowed well into Christianity. Okay, so it, it revealed the truth, and they had to avoid the truth, which was God is a composite unity. And so they eliminated it from, from, the, from the teaching within Judaism. What, what else did our people do in order to, to hide, even within the scriptures, the truth from our people? Parts of Isaiah. Okay, parts of Isaiah. They, they eliminated it from the readings. I mean, it's still in there. It's still in the Tanakh. But they don't read it in the synagogues, which is where most people actually hear the word of God still today. So they just don't read it. Um, what's the old saying? Uh, out of sight, out of mind. So our people have been running from the truth. Well, Messiah was present with them. And so out of compassion for them, he withdraws after having stated to them that they did not believe him because they didn't believe Moses. And he withdraws and he goes up to the mountain. Okay? What happens on a mountain, generally speaking, biblically speaking? Okay, you're, you're isolated, you're alone. It's, there isn't the hustle and bustle of the crowds. But God meets with people. Where God meets with people, yes. And so he meets there with his disciples. It says that he sat with his disciples. What do you, what do you think they did? Just sat there and stared at each other? Okay, they were asking questions, and he was teaching them things that aren't written down here. Okay, he imparted them the mystery of the kingdom of heaven. Is the mystery of the kingdom of heaven con contained entirely in, this, in these pages? No. no, it's not. The mystery of the kingdom of heaven is a mystery, which means you can grasp a little bit, maybe the edges of the mystery. It's a mystery because it doesn't make sense to the mind. God becoming man? God being born of a virgin? Dead people being resurrected? That's mind-blowing. Do you understand how that happened? I don't. It's a mystery. So our, our people constantly wanted what? It says the Jews seek a sign and the Greeks seek wisdom, words, um, um, mental constructs. Okay? So our, those are the two extremes. Well, the mystery of God is somewhere in between. So he taught, he taught them. So in verse 5, it says that Yeshua lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude, what? They were coming towards him. Okay, so can imagine this. He's, he's sitting there and he's, you know, he's, they're on a mountain. There's nothing, nobody around them. And, there's, and, and, and they're having this, this great discussion and he's teaching them. And, and all of a sudden, he was teaching them and imparting to them something very, very intentional. And he, and he, he looks, and so he, if you can imagine him focusing, all of a sudden, yes, he sees movement. And it isn't just a, a deer plodding through there. It's a crowd of people. Imagine like a whole host of people, you know, 300 feet wide coming towards him, a column of people. Yeshua knew how much effort it took to get up on that mountain. What do you think he thinks of when he sees those people? Oh, cheeseburgers. Somebody's got to feed these people. Why do you think he even cared? 
Because he loves us? Why do you think he even cared? (laughs) They got up there themselves. Let them take care of themselves. No. Kai? He, he saw them and he cared. So that they, they see the teacher looking and they look at, at them and what happens next? <clears throat> he says to Philip, where shall we buy bread? That everyone can eat. Okay. Um, they're on a mountain and, and there isn't a quick chip around the corner. Uh, you can't just go, hey, uh, Peter, why don't you rush on down to the QT and uh, pick up a loaf of bread? There was nothing. Why do you think Messiah asks Philip this question? He knew what he was going to do. Okay, he knew what he was going to do? Also to see Philip's reaction. Sure. Okay, yes, testing the faith. He was a bread of life. Mm-hmm. Messiah was, he says, uh, Bill said that Messiah is, is the bread of life. In verse 6 it says, But he said to him to test him, for he knew him, himself what he would do. And Philip answered him and said, 200, it's like denaria, is not, or the bread is not sufficient for them, that even one of them may have a little. Okay? Um, um, we'll just, just put in, imagine 5,000 people. Uh, and you've got a hundred bucks. Uh, or look, let's make it even better than that. You have twenty-five dollars, and there's five thousand people there. And he's like, even if we spent twenty-five bucks, everyone would, would get a bite, and maybe not even that. Not even a bite, hardly. don't think so much that they would depend on the speaker to feed them uh, because n- nobody really actually ever you know, was able to feed crowds of people. Okay. Um, I think it speaks to two things. The hunger of the hearts to see and hear the words of this particular teacher and the, the sinful desire to see a miracle so that they would be, so, they, they could, so that he, they could, he could prove to them that he was who he said he was. I think people sought after him for, for, for those two reasons. Hunger for God and two for the satisfaction of, of their own desires, whatever that, whatever that would be. Okay, so now uh, Philip said, I don't have enough money. Okay, and that, now what happens next? In verse 8 it says, One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, Hey, there's a, a, a boy here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. Okay, that's a good thing, right? I mean, he's got something, but that's not enough to feed everyone, he says. Okay, when you hear of, hey, we've got some food, what do you think of? What's that? That's just going to be enough to eat. Okay. All right, so, I mean, five loaves, is, is, is five loaves enough to feed them? No. Nope. Two fish? Um, Here's, a, here's a, a scale for you and a scale for you. And... No, it's not enough. But where do we know of food that sort of multiplied at some point? Can you think of any, any of the uh, stories from, from the Tanakh? Okay, Moses. <sighs> yep. Okay. So um, another story, um, one of the prophets that... Elisha, yes. So perhaps in that moment of, oh, by the way, he's got some food. I wonder if, if he could multiply the food. Oh, but that's not enough. He also doubted. He, he, he remembered the story of the prophet Elisha who fed 100 men with 20 loaves of bread. And when he did this, so 20 loaves of bread and he fed 100, 100 people. I don't know how, how big the loaves were. I mean, maybe, maybe they, were, they, were, they were small, but the point was is that whatever was there multiplied enough so where everybody was fed, and what else? There was leftovers. Okay? So perhaps um, in that moment, Andrew remembered the story of the prophet Elisha. 
And he thought, the teacher could also multiply, but we have less than the prophet Elisha had. So he also doubted. But he did, then Messiah chose to do something. Could, could Yeshua have said, you want bread? Ka-chow! Could he have done that? Sure could have. Angels are waiting all around him, going, let me do it. Pick me, pick me. He could have put a quick trip on the corner. He could have, the corner. <laughs> he could have done all that. Okay. Why didn't he just make bread magically, or not magically, by his power make it appear? Okay. Uh, uh, why do you think he, he chose to use what was already present? To give the people a visualization that yeah. this minuscule amount is, has been blessed and multiplied to feed the, the masses with leftovers. So much more sustained visual proof of the miracle. Okay. Yes. It doesn't take much. I just need a little. Yep. Okay. He did what he did because he wanted to demonstrate that he has power over visible creation. And he multiplied what was present as a sign of his power over creation. Um, if he had simply made it appear out of nowhere, people could have said, oh, uh, oh, it was, it, it was a trick. But he, he chose to use what was present. It says that in uh, verse 10, that Yeshua said, make the people sit down. And now there was much grass in the place. And the men that sat down, that was number was about 5,000. Why do you think he had them sit down? Probably a couple of reasons, but why do you think he, they had them sit down? Easier for to see. Okay, easier for people to see. Why else? What's that? Okay. Okay, prevent a crush. Um, okay. He had them sit down in the green grass. Uh, it was in the springtime near Passover. He had them sit down in the grass had him sit and be at rest. Does that sound like anything from the scriptures that you know of? Which says, It makes me lie down in green pastures. Um, he was showing an image of the shepherd's desire to feed those that are hungry, all those that come to him. We see that it's 5,000, but there's a whole lot more people there that are present. Okay? This was just the 5,000 men that were present. And it says that he, or he, after he had given them thanks, that he blesses it. Okay, and what did he say to bless this bread? The blessing that we say. It, it's a blessing. Now, he's God. Why did he have to bless the bread? Yes. He wanted to set us an example. In fact, he did a whole lot of things that he didn't have to do, but he chose to do it because we learn by example. And not just words, but deeds and actions that go behind it. So if God, in the form of a man, chose to bless, um, do you think that we should bless God for the food, whatever it is? Maybe you don't, maybe you don't have bread. Uh, maybe it's a sandwich. Maybe it's... Uh, a shake of some kind, maybe it's a salad, uh, is, it, is, is it important to bless yes. the food? Yes. Why do we even bother to bless the food? I mean, it, it's, what's the importance of that? Blessing God for the food. Okay. It's showing reverence, okay. Okay, but we, we earn the money to, uh, to buy this food. Why should we have to thank God for it? Okay, we're acknowledging the source. The grace of God gives us the power to breathe. Say it louder. The grace of God gives us the power to breathe. Okay, 
Okay, the grace of God gives us the power to... So in other words, the very breath that we, that we have is a gift. Um, the very, um, whatever little or much you have in your pockets or your pocketbook is a gift from God. Uh, yes, we apply the effort to earn it, but I can tell you a whole lot of what I have is not because I worked really hard, but it's because of the blessing and the favor of God. I said it before, I'm just not that bright. I'm not, I'm not that good. But God's grace makes me better. And I, I have to thank him for what he has given me. And so he says that he distributed them, in other words, the loaves. So he has how many loaves? Okay, five loaves. And he blesses it. And he, start, he, and he starts handing it out. He goes, hey, you hand that out. And hey, hand that out. And hey, hand that out. And hey, hand that out. And oh, here, hand this one out. And, and then hand this one out. And hey, take that one. Now, how many times was that? Six, seven, eight. Hey, hand this one out. And then they're kind of looking at him going, where's he hiding all that bread? So, I mean, he has a Toledo on his and he keeps pulling bread out of, out of everywhere. And then he says that the fish as well. He had two fish. And he kept handing out the fish. And so it says that they were filled, and he said to his disciples, gather up the fragrance that remain so that nothing is left. Okay? So our Messiah thanks God, he being God, thanks his Father for providing for the needs of the people. And he, he expresses gratitude. Again, why does he express gratitude? because he's setting the example for us, okay? And then he does this because he doesn't need to be, to be grateful. He is helping you and I to see that we need to be grateful. Okay, we're gonna to get to that in a second. It's a, great, it's a great observation, okay? So how many people, oh well, we'll say how many men ate? 5,000. Okay, 5,000. And then how many, how much stuff was left over? Twelve baskets. It's kind of convenient, right? Hmm. Sounds like a, a common number that we're familiar with. Uh, and so who do you think carried those baskets? Yep, the twelve disciples who would become, well, at least eleven of them would become the apostles. It says that even... The one who would betray him carried a basket. Why do you think that he, he wanted them to carry this basket around? What was so important about these 12? Okay, and why would he want them to see? Show the abundance of God. Okay, the show the abundance. Everybody knew there was five loaves and two fishes. Everybody ate. Some of us probably ate a little bit too much. But man, I love fish. Okay, the visual image of Everybody being full and seeing the, the apostles or the disciples carrying 12 baskets full of food at this leftover is a visual image for the people to know that this is not an ordinary teacher. This is not someone who just pulled a parlor trick. Um, everybody knew that he wasn't that, he didn't have bread crammed in his robes because that was a lot of bread. 12 big baskets. Amen. So what is the, the significance of this passage that we just read? The mountain represents a lofty understanding of God. Uh, the mysteries of God which cannot be grasped by the mind, but have to be experienced face to face with God. Okay, the apostles or the disciples sat with God in the form of a man and received his teaching. The five loaves of bread correspond to the five senses that need to be purified. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 
19, which you can just write it down if you're taking notes. Um, this will be out, sent out with the notes. Well, let's just turn over there. Just, just hold your place in John and, and turn over. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. In verse 19, okay, the apostle is, again, in these previous preceding verses, we're speaking of tongues, but in verse 19, he says, yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. Okay, and he was speaking of, of the five senses of us that need to be purified. Why do you think that our senses must be purified? Say it louder. That's the gateway into us. Okay, the gateway into us. Okay. Um, what's this the gateway of? Hearing. Okay. Words. Hearing words. Why, why should I protect these? What you, what you hear goes into your faith. spirit. Faith. Okay. Faith comes by hearing. Okay, faith when that comes by hearing. We, m we must uh, protect what, what here so it does not go here. Why, why should I protect my eyes? Uh, so, um, and then what, what, what's our other sense? Smell, taste. Smell, taste. They're, they're all input in, into us. Okay, and we, these must be purified um, because all of these things affect our minds and our hearts. And so these five senses must be purified. So that's what the significance of the five loaves were corresponding to. And so the apostles, as witnesses of this, carried about these, these baskets. Uh, we, and it was a sign to the, to the nations, to the people as well as to the nations, that this was something special as a current. Okay, they also, the, the baskets that they would have carried them in, they would have most commonly been made out of something. What would that likely have been? Reed? Okay. Wicker? Is it wicker? Palm. Okay. Okay. The, 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 the palm leaves. Um, if you, when you weave things together, um, they're very sturdy. Okay? And so the, the palm leaves of the baskets in which the bread was carried by the apostles corresponds to Psalms 92, 12, which, again, you can write that down. But that verse says, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. Okay, palm trees have a significance in the various um, biblical allusions. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. Um, palm trees have a, have a tendency to be what? Sturdy against the elements. Resilient against the wind. They are strong. They also bend rather than break. It's a heavier base. They remain rooted. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. Back to John. In verse 14. So we see that then these men, when they had seen the sign, of course, the Evergen, all, everything had already happened. They'd already gathered up all the, the fragments. Uh, it says that these men, after they had seen the, the sign that Yeshua did, they said, this truly is a prophet who has come into the world. Okay, hold that thought. He just fed me. <laughs> this is the prophet. Okay, what had he just done in the preceding chapter? He just said that you didn't believe. Okay. You yes, but what did he do in, in, the, in, the, in the sight of the people? He healed, oh, he healed, he healed a paralyzed man on the Sabbath, and they condemned him for breaking the Sabbath. Okay, what did he just do on the same day? 
he made food happen and, and fed them, and, and there was a lot of activity. And, oh, by the way, the apostles were carrying around baskets, which was, a, which was work. And they said, this is the prophet. Moments or hours preceding that, they were condemning him for breaking the Sabbath, but now it didn't appear that they cared that he was breaking the Sabbath. And so we see that in verse 15... It says that when Yeshua perceived that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, he departed again to what? He went, up, went to a different mountain. And they found me here. Oh, all right. Headed to a different mountain. Okay, what, is, what did that verse just say? They saw a miracle. They ate. And now they're about ready to what? Revolt, Revolt and make him a king. And, and because they're going to make him free, him, free them. Uh, I don't remember that being a part of the scriptures of the Messianic prophecies of when the Messiah comes, we're going to take him by force and make him free us. Do, do you remember reading that? Was that in, was, the, was it like the book of second delusions? I don't know. <laughs> didn't, it didn't make it in here. So um, they wanted to make him king. Ironically, when their bellies were full. Okay. And this, which is, in, in a, I guess you could say an allusion to the gluttony that they had just experienced. Again, I ate too much fish because I like fish. Whew. Man, if we get this guy to be king, if we're set, right? Well, I mean, they also believed in that time that the Messiah would come to save them from the oppression, the oppression of Rome. They, they looked at it as a political savior rather than a spiritual savior. So they recognized that this guy is the Messiah. Let's just Make him king. Cut to the chase. Yeah. I mean, that would be, a, that'd be amazing. I mean, he, he's pretty good so far. I mean, yeah, we'll kind of overlook that whole breaking the Sabbath thing. And we'll kind of be happy with that he made, made us food. Well, it says, in continuing in verse 16, it says, When the evening came out, his disciples went down to the sea and got into the boat and went over the sea towards Capernaum. And it was already dark and Yeshua had not come to them. So they're basically hanging out, okay? Messiah went up by himself, and they waited, and they waited, and they waited. It was almost dark. So what did they do? They're like, all right, well, let's get in a boat and uh, head back home. Okay, so we see that they got in the boat. And they went over towards Capernaum. It was already dark, and Yeshua had not come to them. Then the sea arose, because a great wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Yeshua walking on the sea, drawing near to them. And they were what? They were kind of freaked out. Okay? I mean, here we are in a boat. It's a bit disturbing, all this storm thing happening. Oh my gosh, is that the teacher? Wait, is he walking on the water? Do you think he cared about them? There wasn't a rhetorical question. Yes. Yeah, of, 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 of course he cared about them. Why did he let the storm happen? To show. To stir them up. Okay. To show them, to stir them, to, to bring... Uh, okay. He, their joy... How about, how do you think they felt at, at that moment when they saw him and all the wind happening and they, and they saw him? Okay, they were disturbed, I think, to say the least. How do you think they felt on the other side of that after he had saved them? Pretty good? Safer? Safer? Okay. Do you think they were, had they simply gone across the, the lake and saw him on the other side, do you think they'd be, have been glad to see him? Sure. Yeah. How glad were they to see him when he did this? Oh, there. A whole lot. Yeah. Okay. So he permitted them to experience that so that the joy of his, of his presence would be even greater. Messiah brings tranquility in two ways. He calms the storm within us. And sometimes he calms the storm that is around us. 
Moses led the people through the water at the command of God. But Yeshua walks on the water by his own power so that the prophecy of Job uh, 9 and verse 8 would be fulfilled. And again, I'll just quote that in the, in, the, in the presence of time. That says, He that walks upon the water as if it were dry land. Okay, and we sang that in one of, the, of our songs today. That he who has created all things walks upon the water as if it were dry land. Okay, so they're, they're kind of freaked out. And in verse 20 it says, He said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. What do you think he was saying when he said that to them? Okay. I am God. We focus on him, nothing else matters. What is he saying? And what did Philip just say about trials? Are we going to go through them? Yes. 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 Is he is with us. Okay. In truth, what do we have to fear? Somebody who, who can take our stuff? Um, our life? No one can take your life unless it is granted to them by God. Your life is in God's hands, not at the will or the whim of man. Okay, your steps are ordered by the king, not by the government, not by the people out in the streets. If you are God's, then nothing will happen except by his will or his permission. When Messiah says, it is I, he is saying, I Abide forever, being God, I am he who is. I am the I am. That's pretty comforting. It was comforting to them out in the middle of that stormy lake in a boat. It's calming and should be comforting to you and to me when we begin to allow that to become more than just head knowledge and heart knowledge. And I experienced that this week. And I failed, but I realized it. And then the peace came. And I recognized, I am these disciples in the middle of a storm, afraid. What do I have to fear? Nothing happens except by his permission or his will. And if that is the case, then all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Okay, ter ter sorry. terror and trials are temporary, but the I am is forever. So now he says, it is I, do not be afraid. What happens? But, but what does it say? Okay, they willingly received him. Okay? Yeshua again in the boat. Because they knew Growing knowledge, that, uh, they struggled. Do you think they knew he was God? Yes, they did. But did they believe he was God? No, they doubted just like you and me, just like we do every day. I believe in God. Oh, Lord, help my unbelief. Okay? It's a struggle between the rational and the mystery of God, which cannot be contained in pages, and it cannot be contained in thoughts. God is the I am. And the mystery of that is something that we will contemplate and live in the experience of forever as we stand in the presence of God, experiencing the glory and the light of God, if that be permitted for us to be there. So it says that they invited him into the boat. Okay, now I want you to picture this. They're in the boat, and they're disturbed, and he's walking across the water, which is even more kind of freaking me out. And then he's standing there, and he says, it is I. And they recognized that he was present with them in that moment. Get into, my, get into the boat, Messiah. Yeshua, come. Come inside. Okay, does it say that he got into the boat? It doesn't say that he got in the boat. 
it says they said, come in to the boat. And immediately they found themselves at dry land. Yeshua, please get into the boat. Boom. They're, they're, the boat's next to dry land. And there they were. In an instant, when they recognized and believed and let him into their boat, there they were, safe, because salvation is proximity to God, the closeness to God. He says, let me walk with you in this life. The saints and the martyrs have walked through this life for 2,000 years, suffering, experiencing trials, tribulations, martyrdom, death. They laid down their lives because they loved not their lives and they gained them back for eternity because they were willing to walk in the path of, of their teacher before them. The apostles all died, save one. They walked in the ways of their teacher. And so it is on down, on down to our present age. When we find ourselves in the middle of a storm or trial, let us also remember that it is temporary, whatever it is. That we have as our protector the I am who will bring us through the difficulty no matter what it is or how he brings us through, whatever that looks like. If we die for, world, for whatever reason, if we die in faith, for Hashem. For Hashem. There is nothing to fear because God is with us. So let us also strive to enter by the narrow way of humility to enter into the kingdom that we may abide forever in the tents of the king and even in the new Jerusalem which is above. Amen. Amen. Father, we ask that you would continue to allow the words of the Holy Gospels to sink into our hearts, Master. Not just stories that we've read in the past, but words of life for us today, now, in this moment. And Master, let that soothing rain soften our hardened hearts. O Master, among mine is the most hard. Lord, that we would believe not with the, the seeing of the eyes, but with the understanding of the heart of faith. Master, thank you for never abandoning us. Oh Lord, whatever it takes, whatever it takes to be in your presence, may we walk out the narrow path of salvation unto you. May you be praised forever and ever in both worlds. Amen.